there's only one story in town. Well, there are more, there are more than one, or there is more than, there is more than one story of importance, but action against Syria is all anyone is talking about and has been talking about this week. You heard in the news that the French President Emmanuel Macron said today that he has proof that the Syrian government attacked the town of Douma with chemical weapons last weekend. Macron said that he would decide in due course whether to respond with airstrikes. Here he is, very briefly speaking today. We have the proof that last week, now almost 10 days, chemical weapons were used, at least chlorine. They were used by the Assad regime. We will need to take decisions in due course when we judge it to be most useful and effective. Yeah, there you go. Pretty short and sweet from Macron. He said, the Rothschild lackey, by the way, and he is, he said that he knows it was the Syrians what did it. But he can't know, of course. This isn't conjecture, by the way. This is fact. He can't know because nobody has independently verified that one, chemical weapons were used, or two, that Syria was behind it. Okay? Now, this is a point well made by former UK ambassador to Syria, Peter Ford. Now, he was on breakfast television today. Have a listen to how that went. Let's go back to our main story now this morning. The Prime Minister, Theresa May, preparing for that special meeting with the Cabinet later today to discuss how the UK should respond to President Assad's alleged chemical attack in Syria. We can talk to Peter Ford, who's a former ambassador to Syria. He's now a member of the lobby group, the British Syrian Society, which does have links to the Assad family. And Peter's been a long-term critic of Western policy in the country. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, let's first of all start with this chemical attack. Do you think that President Assad is behind, is responsible for this? No, I don't, uh, because the evidence is extremely thin, thin to vanishing. All the sources of information about this attack come from the side of the, the militant Islamist armed groups. Without exception, all the information, there is not one single source of independent information on what actually happened in Douma. And there is every reason to believe that the Islamists have uh, mounted uh, a fake attack in order to stampede the West into coming down. When you say fake down. attack, what do you mean? That there was no chemical attack, that the images are probably faked. The important thing is to get the international inspectors into Douma and they are in Damascus now, they're on their way. The important thing is to get the inspectors in to verify what I've just said. Yeah, let the inspectors in. The Russians said yesterday, as we covered yesterday, the Russian government said is that it would guarantee the safety of these inspectors. I must point out, and I should have pointed out at the top of the programme, that the British government, the UK government, well, the cabinet has met and is meeting at Downing Street today. And as I came to air, they were still at Downing Street considering the UK's response to the allegations that chemical weapons were used. Now, the BBC, amongst other organisations, is speculating that the Prime Minister, Theresa May, will say that they won't, if they decide to take military action against Syria, that they will not seek parliamentary approval. Now, I speculated uh, on that very point myself in an article that I posted to richieallen.co.uk earlier in the week, but I might be wrong. May might come out and say, well, we will put it to parliament. But the the mass media is speculating that she won't, right? Good stuff from Peter Ford there. Nobody has any proof that Syria did it. Let the inspectors in and let's see what happens. More from that interview, he is being spoken to by a, a woman called Naga Monchetti, who's a, a BBC presenter. Here's more of it. The World Health Organization doesn't believe these images were faked. The, the WHO has repeated claims, claims made by the same sources that produced the videos, that is, by the Islamist militants. Um, not by any independent observers. 
And President this is a crucial detail. There is absolutely no impartial evidence. The BBC itself, Naga, can I remind you, saying that the images in the videos are unverified. Is that not correct? That is correct. Um, but President Assad, is it not correct, has been found to have used chemical weapons before. Do you understand why there is this collation of evidence or collation of assumptions? Collation of evidence or collation of assumptions? Which is it, Naga Monchetti? Is there a collation of hard evidence that Assad has used the weapons or... In reality, is there a collation of accusations and assumptions? She said it herself, didn't she? That has put him in the spotlight and put him down as someone who is but responsible the, for these attacks. He's done it before. The, the important thing is to get inspectors in now to verify the facts of what happened in the last several days. Whatever happened in the past, and that is still open to question, if you actually look at the report, by the UN inspectors from the attack one year ago, you will see troubling facts, such as that some of the alleged uh, victims who were presenting to hospital one hour before the Syrian planes had even left the ground. Very important that, eh? Do you remember that? We talked about that last year. The last time Syria was accused, well, not the last time, but the last major incident Syria was accused of, obviously it was accused of using chemical weapons a few weeks ago, but go back to last year when Trump authorised strikes which were just meaningless and nonsense. You'll remember that they were able to prove and the United Nations had to acknowledge that people were presenting themselves to hospitals claiming they had been injured before anything had actually taken place. The mendacity. The lies were exposed last year. They're being exposed this year too. The ground. Okay. Let's move, let's move on from... Let's not move on, Naga. He just said to you that the United Nations itself last year said people were going to hospitals before anything happened. Oh, let's move on. In case our audience interest is piqued and our audience says, what? I'd like to hear a bit more about that. From, from whether this is fact or not. Let's, let's say... Let's move on from whether this is fact or not, she says. Have a listen to what she says next. It's really revealing about how the media operates. Whether this is fact or not, let's, let's say evidence has been found to prove that President Assad was behind this. Marvellous. She says, let's just pretend that evidence has been found to prove that Assad was behind it. What would you do? Why not start with, let's pretend that evidence has been found that proves Assad didn't do it. <laughs> Why? Why always Assad did it? It's crazy stuff, isn't it? This and look at which is where the U.S. appears to be at this moment in time. What no, do you, what sorry, do you, the U.S. What does do you not make? appear to be there. General Mattis yesterday was saying that the evidence, the assessment, cannot yet be concluded because all the evidence is not yet. Well, Donald in. Trump, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, has threatened to bomb Syria. That's where he's at at wow. this moment in time. Marvellous. Mattis and some of the other generals are saying, well, maybe we should have a think about this. And her response is, well, President Trump says he did it and he's going to bomb Syria. We all know that President Trump uh, says things and his generals, who know what they're talking about, say something else. General Mattis, who does know probably what he's talking about, says that the assessment is continuing that can only mean that the evidence is not yet in. Looking at the, what the Russian ambassador has said, the Russian ambassador to Lebanon, there are also, so there's also strong language there, strong exchanges there. Mm. What do you make of this situation, this diplomatic situation now? Where do you see it going next? It, it, we have an emergency cabinet meeting called it, today by our prime minister. It, it's hair-raising, and the idea that we could be going into a possible hot war with Russia because the scope for miscalculation and accidents is enormous. The idea that we could be going into such a dangerous conflict on the basis of contested images and reports from jihadi sources such as the White Helmets, who are the so-called first responders, who are Islamist militants who help in beheadings and amputations of hands and feet. And it's on the testimony of such first responders and so-called monitors 
that this country might be on the point of making another grave mistake. And let me remind you, please, about Iraq, when we were so confident, were we not? All the intelligence, you remember Colin Powell? Please, let us not have another case of being taken to war on a false prospectus. Brilliant stuff by Peter Ford there. Really good stuff there. He nailed the White Helmets group, what it is. It's a bunch of militant Islamists pretending to be, uh, effectively pretending to be there to help and to correlate efforts to help when strikes happen. But the truth, of course, the reality of what the White Helmets are, we've ex- we've explained using evidence on this programme and many others have done the same. That was an excellent performance. Appearance, you could call it performance because of his associations with the Assad family. But everything he said there was rational and reasonable. Jeremy Corbyn is the leader of the Labour Party, of course. He's not said much today, but he was um, caught for a quick comment by RT. Russia, America, the European Union, all the neighbouring countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, have got to be involved in ensuring there is a real ceasefire and a political process that does give hope to the people of Syria in the future. More bombing, more killing, more war will not save life, will just take more lives and spawn the war elsewhere. I think Jeremy was at a, a school, not a, but the schools are on holidays, aren't they? Some of them are. I think he was at some event where there were a lot of children in the background. But I think you heard what he said there. It's exactly 17 minutes past the hour. This is the Richie Allen show for Thursday, April 12th, 2018. The 12th was when the Titanic set off, I think. Anyway, enough of that. We had a bit of light relief today then, or at least I did anyway. So what's it like to be on the receiving end of chemical weapons, to be underneath them, to be confronted with a chemical weapon strike on your neighbourhood or on your home? Well, Sky News presenter Kay Burley wanted to know what it's like to be on the receiving end of chemical weapons. Have a listen to this. This is very interesting. Let's get the perspective now from someone who has survived a chemical weapons attack. Kasim Aid almost died in a sarin gas attack in Syria in 2013. He joins us from Washington. Hi, Kasim. Thank you for joining us on Sky News. First of all, tell us what happened to you. Right. She sounded overwhelmed with interest there, didn't she? Right. So this guy's name is Kasim Aid. K A S S E M E I D. She described him as a victim of a chemical attack in Syria. And he's live, well he was live today, from Washington, D.C. It says so on the screen, he's in D.C. He's a victim, remember, he fled Syria, right? That's how he's been introduced to the audience, and this is very important. A victim of chemical attacks, fled Syria, he's now living in the United States. But it becomes very apparent, as soon as he begins answering the question that she asked him, that he's far more than someone who fled Syria, far more. And because you mightn't believe me, I'm going to play the guy's entire answer. I haven't caught it in any way. I might interject, I might say something, I might pause it, but it hasn't been cut at all. And what I want you to listen to is what he says, and notice that Kay Burley, the presenter, completely disappears and is nowhere to be heard, let alone nowhere to be seen. So listen again to what Kay Burley says and then we'll hear this guy's answer. Let's get the perspective now from someone who has survived a chemical weapons attack. Kasim Aid almost died in a sarin gas attack in Syria in 2013. He joins us from Washington. Hi Kasim, thank you for joining us on Sky News. First of all, tell us what happened to you. Right, what happened to you? So what does he say? Are you listening now? Listen carefully. Thank you for having me. Uh, After uh, living under two years of Assad bombardment and siege in August 21st, 2013, Assad has launched a sarin gas attack against our town and other towns in eastern Ghouta. Uh, I uh, got exposed to sarin gas uh, and it was the most painful thing I've ever been through. I always describe that day as Judgment Day, 
Men, women and children were running, screaming, falling on the ground, choking, suffocating without knowing what happened. Uh, the burning sensation in my lungs, in my eyes, in my heart is something that I will never uh, forget. But the most painful thing about the memory of that day was holding a little boy who was suffocating and staring in his glassy eyes in his face that was colored with all colors of terror and fear and just simply trying to understand how could anyone do that to One someone minute. else how can you suffocate children how can you choke them while they're sleeping how can you bomb and rape and gas hundreds of thousands of people and pretend that you're fighting terrorism while you are the re real terrorist few days after I survived the attack, I also helped the OPCW when they arrived to Mount Damie to uh, examine the evidence and uh, uh, examine the missiles that the Assad regime has used. And they examined patients, they took blood samples. They took blood samples and uh, uh, gathered data from uh, Mount Damie until the regime started bombing our town again, forcing them to leave. I have total faith in OPCW and I know they are uh, super professional and they are they truly uh, risked their lives back in 2013 to actually investigate that hideous crime against humanity but unfortunately all what we got is a broken promise from Obama's red line and a lying deal with the Russians back in 2014 saying that they're going to take Assad chemical weapons stock four years later I promise you five years is later, actually still there uh, Thousands of people uh, kept getting killed by chemical weapons, by chlorine gas and sarin gas and mustard gas and God knows what gas. Because until now, we are not allowed to investigate, to properly investigate uh, the crimes in Syria. Three days ago, for your dear audience, this is something very important to know. Uh, almost two days after the chemical massacre, uh, three days ago, uh, Putin sent his military police to Douma, to the same place where it got hit with chemical weapons when they denied the use of chemical weapons they sent their uh, military police to literally uh, gather and destroy the evidence my friends inside Duma filmed the Russian military police right he said there I just paused it by the way that his friends told him that Putin sent Russian military police to Duma to clean up evidence of a chemical weapons attack to hide the evidence to pervert the course of justice and our great friend Kay Burley doesn't interject. We'll play the rest of it. Filmed the Russian military police while they were going to those sites. They also held the doctors who were helping and treating patients during the chemical attack hostage in Damascus. So uh, if someone is listening from the OPCW or from whoever uh, is pretending that they actually care about Syria, why don't you go to the hospitals and look for the doctors of Duma? Why don't you go to the sites and actually try to talk to people away from Assad? There is Three a lot minutes of patients and 30 who got seconds. exposed to sarin, and they're now uh, 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 they made it out of uh, to Turkey with the help of uh, uh, some good people. So we have evidence, just like we have evidence over uh, uh, 200 documents. Remember, this guy was uh, inter of chemical weapons. Remember, in this guy was introduced as a victim of chemical weapons. He was on to talk about the experience of it. Held accountable. Otherwise, we're just gonna give ISIS another excuse to come and tell people that the West and the international community doesn't care about you and we're the only Four ones minutes. here to help. Uh, inaction in Syria bum, bum, means fueling bum, ISIS 2.0. So for, uh, uh, with all the respect uh, uh, to idiots like uh, Nigel Farage and others, uh, when Hitler was bombing and gassing oh, and Jews. torturing millions of Jews the back Jews. In, two, uh, in World War II, there were voices in the world saying that it didn't happen or maybe it's not our problem or maybe we should just move on and send them some aid and uh, after a Four devastating minutes and war 30 70 seconds. million people got killed we learned a valuable lesson never again means never again never let dictators kill people and commit war crimes Go on, unaccountable Kay. because that will send the world into chaos Get in, there, in the past seven years in action in Syria has helped creating ISIS and fueling bum, bum, extremists bum, bum, not just in the Middle bum, East we're seeing bum. the rise of the alt-right in Europe in the States all over the world 
uh, extremists are fueling themselves with inaction. It's time for humanity to show uh, uh, criminals like Assad Five minutes. that enough is enough. That it's about time for Assad to be held accountable for his war crimes. There is a crematorium in Sednaya that the uh, U.S. intelligence just uh, announced uh, uh, the information about last summer. That crematorium, uh, Assad burned and killed 100,000 wow. people uh, in Sednaya. I've told the U.S. State Department about that site back in 2014 during meetings after I just fled Syria and I managed to escape from the Assad regime and Hezbollah in Lebanon. All what I got is just broken promises and some notes and some uh, uh, just sympathy words. Uh, two months ago, I was at Ambassador Nikki Haley's office. In two months ago, he was at Ambassador Nikki Haley's office. He went to the State Department. But this guy was introduced as a victim of chemical weapons who fled to the United States. He's now been speaking for 5 minutes and 40 seconds with no interjection by our heroine, Kay Burley. This is wonderful stuff, this. This is what I've been trying to introduce to the thinking of my audience for several years now. This is not journalism, this isn't news. This is propaganda. This guy is no more a victim of chemical weapons in Syria than the future Mrs. Allen is. He's there to drive home a narrative. And he continues for another few seconds before Kay gets the nod to jump in. ...office in New York and I warned her assistants about an upcoming chemical attack because I still have friends on the ground okay. in Syria okay. and also inside the, uh, the Syrian Kassim. government I understand. who okay. informed me and they completely I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Kassim, but I've given you an opportunity to explain exactly how you're feeling about it. A whole uh, range of issues there. A whole range of issues there. I've given you an opportunity to explain, but Kay's first question was... In what way? Kay's first question was... Let's get the perspective now from someone who has survived a chemical weapons attack. Kasim Aid almost died in a sarin gas attack in Syria in 2013. He joins us from Washington. Hi, Kasim. Thank you for joining us on Sky News. First of all, tell us what happened to you. Yeah, he spoke without an interruption for five minutes and 50 seconds. He's no victim who fled from Syria. He knows people like Nikki Haley and others. After all he said about Russia sending in soldiers to hide evidence, after all the lies he told about crematoriums and people being gassed and murdered and burned, all that nonsense that's never been verified by anybody, Kay stopped him finally. What was the follow-up question from Kay Burley, do you think? One wonders um, how you would, what you would say to the British people that if they say they completely understand what has happened to you, to those um, that were near and dear to you, and you, you've eloquently expressed what has happened to you with the sarin gas attack. And I can see um, from your heavy breathing just how much, you, when you remember what happened to you, how it, it still affects you very deeply. But one wonders... Kay is throwing out bucket loads of pathos there. She can see because he's breathing heavily how deeply affected by all of this he is. He's not affected by it at all. He's reading a script. He's reading autocue. You can tell that he's reading autocue as he's doing it. He isn't delivering this off the top of his head. This is the media. The media is the most treacherous. I won't say any more. Listen. Does, uh, ...here in the United Kingdom and in other parts of Europe as well, whether, even if these um, uh, military attacks, if we did see them take place by the United States, by the United Kingdom and by France, it led to um, a greater war, if you will, would that be worth it, in your opinion? Wow. Would it all be worth it if we interjected and it led to a greater war? The most astonishing thing he said was that he had evidence that Russian military personnel was in fact in Duma cleaning up evidence of a chemical attack. He said he had friends who had video footage of it. That's your next question. If you're studying journalism and you're listening to this program, you won't need me to tell you that. If you are a real journalist and you're listening to this program, you won't need me to tell you that. If you're not somebody who thinks about these things very often, you probably need me to tell you that. That should have been her question, but she shouldn't have allowed him go beyond that. The minute he said that, she should have stopped him. Whoa! Whoa, whoa, hang on a second there. Kasim, you said the Russians were cleaning up the evidence and you, have, you, you yourself have got a bombshell video that proves that. Why didn't you give us a copy of it? 
It's as simple as that. This is the media. And this is the cheerleading effort, or the media is heading up the cheerleading effort for war. The media wants war. It's begging for it. It's throwing out Peter Ford, the former Syrian ambassador, every now and then. It'll throw out an academic from a university every now and then to say that it's the wrong thing to do. But 99% of the commentary and of the articles that we're seeing in the newspapers are saying we should be bombing Assad. We should be bombing Damascus. We can't allow children to be killed by chemical weapons and all that. Right, let me get rid of the Jeopardy music. Let me get rid of that. Right, quick break. When we come back, Paul Craig Roberts, former US Assistant Secretary of the Treasury and, of course, a great journalist. He joins us live from Virginia. <laughs> 